This afternoon's event I'm very proud of. Uh, we have with us Thomas Romine, who is a member of the Ewings chapter of the Sons of the Revolution and a plural member of the Marietta and Hawking Valley chapters of the Sons of the Revolution. He has played drums for more than 55 years. He has served in the U.S. Army bands at Fort Meade, Maryland, Vietnam, and Salt Lake City, Utah. He holds bachelor's and master's degrees in music from the University of Utah and a doctor of musical arts degree from Ohio State University. He is a life member of the American Legion, the Veterans of Foreign Wars, and the Company of Fifes and Drummers. Tom has performed as a Revolutionary War drummer in parades with color guards from veterans organizations and with Sons of the American Revolution color guards and at the Brigade of the American Revolution events. Let us give a warm applause and welcome for our guest, Tom Romine. Does the date April 19th, 1775 mean anything to anybody? Well, to William Diamond, and the book is about William Diamond's drum, well, it's actually not about that. William Diamond was the drummer at Lexington at the very beginning of the Revolutionary War. Probably about daylight, six o'clock or so in the morning, Captain John Parker turned to William Diamond and said, play two arms. Because by that time, they could see the tops of the British bayonets marching up the road. So William Diamond played this. That was the signal that the drummers played to get the rest of the army or the, the soldiers, the riflemen, in formation to be ready to fire. How much he knew about the various drum calls, we don't know. But we do know that they could only learn them from one place, and that was from the British. So a lot of our early Revolutionary War music came from the British and all of the drum beatings, and that's what they were called, drum beatings, were basically from the British. And over the period of time they evolved and became into what we kind of use today in reenactment type of events. So the first thing that would happen every morning is somebody would go and wake up the drummer. Well, the drummer was usually awake because they were, somebody was always awake all the time. The army never sleeps. But even then, somebody would wake up the head drummer or the drummer of the watch and say, play drums call. And this is what it would sound like. is a fife tune that goes with it, but I can't play the fife. One reason I never practice. And the other thing is I can't play the fife and drum at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> but the fife tune, I can't whistle it either. But the fifers, what that would do is one drummer starting that, then all of the other drummers would come and join in playing the same thing until all of the fifers and drummers 
of the particular unit would be there. So let me go back and describe what the particular units were with each company. And the company was generally at that time maybe 20 men. There was always one fifer and one drummer for every company. Well, I don't say always. If they could find a fifer and a drummer, they would have one fifer and every drummer. So if you had 10 companies in a regiment, you would have a regiment of, let's say, 200 soldiers, and you would have 10 fifers and 10 drummers. So you can imagine, by the time 10 drummers were playing this and 10 fifers were playing the tune, it could be heard, and they would hear it quite easily. But going back to the morning, after all of the fifers and drummers are assembly, assembled, they would play Reveille. Now, the Reveille they used then is nothing like what we know as a Reveille bugle call today. But the Reveille they played then for the drum part was... could go on and on. I mean, it could be repeated over and over. They had a fife part. After that, they might play a familiar tune. Or they might just start off marching to that very same thing, up and down in front of the tents. Uh, the tents would look like the far picture over there. There would be an open area in front of the tents, and there would be an adjutant's tent out in front. That's a picture of your town battlefield, and my tent is the one with the coat thrown over it, just to mark <laughs> where it is. And, but in this open field, that's where all of the soldiers would gather after Reveille. And that would be for, that would just basically just to be to wake them up. So then, depending on what they were going to do the rest of the day, if they were gonna stay in camp, which was usually the procedure, they would play the assembly, which was, and I'm just going to play a short version of it. And it too had a fife tune. And all of the soldiers knew all of these. They knew what these drum beatings were, and they obviously knew what the, what the fife tunes were. So that was the signal for them to assemble on the parade ground or the common ground for them to take the roll, to find out if, you know, anything was basically just to take the roll. Because soldiers would wander off, as they always did. <laughs> but the one exception was, after Reveille, if the camp was going to break up and they were going to move, they played what was called the general. And that was the signal, and all the soldiers knew this was the signal. So after they finished the Reveille, then they would play the general. up their tents, they would not have an assembly, they would just pack up their tents, load their tents on the wagons, and the soldiers would be ready then to form up and march. Now, if they were marching, they do other things. They don't march like we see marches today. They wouldn't march like the parade. No drummer would play as long as I did yesterday. <laughs> Two reasons. One is they didn't have paved streets. And I wondered if, what well, that Lincoln Avenue is paved. <laughs> that was the hardest street to walk on yesterday. That's, that's rough. But I'll get to that when I explain about the shoes and everything. But uh, they would, the drummers would play something like this. Um,
they play that last note, that was the signal for them to step off in a march formation, not in a tempo. They would be able to march at whatever. They would just be required to stay somewhat in line. Again, because of the roads, they didn't have paved roads that were marchable, really. Sometimes they were just paths. So the drummers, the drummers still had to carry their drums. And if a drummer decided to put his drum on a baggage wagon, he was likely to be flogged because he didn't get away with it. So let me back up a bit and uh, let me play some other calls that were set for being in camp. So every company, and really every regiment had an adjutant. And the drums were supposedly stacked outside the adjutant's tent. And they would stack them, they would lay them down this way and then stack them up and they, they don't roll very well, but then they would just make a pyramid of them. And that's where all the drums were. I don't do that when I do a reenactment. This drum cost me too much money <laughs> to be leaving out outside. That's why I have a larger tent. It's just for this baby and me. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, there would be a call. The commanding officer would want to talk to the adjutant. So the adjutant call is this. It's very much the same as assembly. repeated three times. The adjutant would then come to the colonel's tent or whatever the commanding officer was. So let's say then the adjutant wants to talk to the first sergeant, which is tip pretty typical in the chain of command. So then the drummer would play the first sergeant's calls. So just not one first sergeant, there would be a first sergeant for every company. So then that's how the communications were handled. But then there were other non-commissioned officers, corporals, um, regular sergeants, so on and so forth, and it varied with the makeup of the company. So then there's a non-commissioned officer's call, very similar to the first sergeant's call. they would all get together. So in the daily normal routine of, a, uh, uh, of an army, uh, several things have to happen. They have to eat. In order to eat, they have to have water, usually. Or somebody has to go get water. And it's usually down the river or something. Well, they would send a detail of men with buckets, and this might be one person from every company, might be 10 people, well not 10 people, well, you know, quite a few people from each company. They'd usually, if they were outside the camp or a distance away, they would have to have a guard. But there is a call for people to assemble to go get water. And that is just simply. <laughs> What's another thing you need to do in order to cook? You have to have a fire, right? And so what do you have to have to make a fire? You have to have wood. So this is the wood call. This would be the signal for people who are assigned to go gather wood or cut down trees or whatever they had to do to get wood. And this will make a whole lot of sense, I think, when you hear it. signal for wood. It's wood on wood. <laughs> so I already told you a little bit about the two arms. That would, might be the next thing that comes up. But let's say that, that they know they're going to prepare for a battle, but they're not really sure when they need to be ready. The, the regular infantry needs to be ready. So they would have the, the soldiers or the, the drummers play. First of all, they would always play before each one of these things and it gets monotonous, is the drums call. 
because that's for all the drummers to get together and play the same thing. So they would get all the drummers together to play to arms, which was the roll. Again. But then, let's say that they've got everybody there. The, uh, the soldiers are at, they would probably be at, at a grounded arms. In other words, their muskets would be, the, the butts would be on the ground. But they would play a preparative. And that would be like this. Now it comes the controversy in the modern day. Sometimes this is not played at all. Sometimes it's played once. Sometimes then after preparative, then there's the command of prime and load, which means to prime the flintlock with powder and pull the hammer back, uh, and then and then the, which then would be shortened to this. Prime and load would be. And then the last thing is the fire, which would be, and I've been in reenactments where that's used, all of that's used. I've been in where that's not used. So nobody really knows because nobody's alive from back then to tell us. They have a few instruction books, and in 1776, early 1777, uh, a gentleman came to the camp in Valley Forge by the name of von Steuben, uh, Frederick von Steuben. He, was a Prussian, claimed to be a Prussian officer, but at that time anybody could claim to be an European officer, and they got a lot of money, and you know, because they were supposed to know things. But anyway, he set up a rule book, or a book of rules, and I have a Baron von Steuben's Revolutionary War Drill Manual. And in here it tells what everyone's supposed to be doing, for, for their drill, and the drill was primarily for discipline, but it was also useful on the battlefield. But I want to keep going here. I've got two other things to do before we, um, before I talk about some other things and play some other things. One of the things is at the end of the day, and it's still done in the military today, is a retreat. And this is not a retreat like everybody come and run away. You know, it's not that sort of retreat. It's it's a it's a ceremony and it's the retreat was to reassemble the people at the end of the day and so the retreat for the drums would be and then that's repeated and repeated and repeated and with the fife tune and most of these things have little phrases that are so long and the fife tune is that long and then the drums keep playing the same thing but the fife tune changes so uh, the drum parts get rather boring but we're talking about kids here playing these things so then the very final thing of the day was when it was approximately 10 o'clock and they were supposed to turn off the electric lights you know, <laughs> and screw the bowl now, it was when the lights were supposed to be out and everyone was supposed to be in their tent, and it's called a tap two, which comes from a Dutch origin word, which means close the taps, the taps on the whiskey barrels and the beer barrels. And that's where it comes from. The tap two for the drummer, and this is really boring. <laughs> thing over and over until they finish the fife tune. But a drummer could play that alone if there wasn't a fifer and do fine. I mean, the people would know what it was and they would know that that was the time that they were supposed to be in their tents. Now, there were other things that went on during the day. Sometimes they happened in some camps, sometimes they didn't in others. Um, there is a fatigue march where they're supposed to, it's supposed to be a signal for them to wash and get cleaned up and prepare their areas and um, still sort of a fatigue duty now in the current military where they go out. I mean, when I was in, they'd go around and pick up cigarette butts because people smoked and they smoked filtered cigarettes. I never smoked filtered cigarettes. I smoked them without the filter. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't have to pick up the butts, the filters, you know. I could just tear them apart and tobacco but that's a whole other thing uh, but anyway 
Then there was the Rogues March, and the Rogues March had a couple different uses, um, and I don't, I'm not going to play it, but because it's more significant if you hear the Fife melody. But the Rogues March was was used uh, first to clear all of the unmilitary personnel out of the camps. Uh, yeah, they had camp followers. There were wives who followed the, their army around. They have non-wives, females, who followed the army around. <laughs> so what that was to get those people out of the camp. Uh, the other thing the Rhodes March was for was if somebody was going to be flogged and uh, they would be marching to the area where they would be flogged. And these were attended by everybody. Uh, I could not find, <laughs> sounds funny, could not find my cat of nine tails or I would have brought it along. One of the unpleasant tasks that drummers had was they did the flogging. Oh. And I have several theories about this. Now I'm reading a book on the British Navy right now and they, they didn't use necessarily young boys to do the flogging, but my theory about why that was done in the Revolutionary War during the, for the Continental, in other words, the American Army, was that one is they were young boys, and they were not as strong as maybe a full-grown man. So they would not be able to do the, the lashes as hard. That's just one theory. The other theory is, and there really wasn't any retaliation. If somebody was flogged, they knew that they stole something or they went to sleep on guard duty or they were drunk or whatever. They knew they had committed something against the rule, so they weren't necessarily going to retaliate against the person flogging them. But it was an unnecessary or it was an unfortunate thing that, that the drummers had to do. And I think my theory of them being smaller um, and not able to to really lay it on with a, with a whip is is probably more accurate. But uh, so let me talk about the ages of the drummers. They were probably the youngest, maybe 12, up to about 17 or 18 when they could carry a carry a rifle or a musket. Um, I also have a theory. I haven't proved this at all. Um, but I think there were a lot of fathers and sons. The fathers were in the army. Their sons went along and became drummers. And they learned how to do this. The other thing that happened in camp is they didn't practice. You couldn't practice on your own in a camp. Because you would be playing a signal that somebody could mistake as, you know, they could be practicing and they thought the enemy was coming. You know? <laughs> so after a, I mean, very short time, very early on, they designated a time when the fifes and drums, or the music, as it was described, would go and practice at a certain place on a drill field together, so that they were always practicing together. Washington was particularly sensitive to the music and how it was played, because George Washington was a flutist, flautist, flutist. So he would be very much aware of what the fifes were playing and how they were playing. Now I have two fifes here, and I'm not, I, I can try to get a sound out of them for you, but uh, maybe I should do that. It's not hollow. Well, it's hollow up to here. And it's just past the blowhole, and it's got six, six holes along the top. So, Again, if, if I practice, I can play it. <laughs> My wife complains, but that's, I should make her play it. No. Talk about my wife, that's doing So let me talk about some of the things that drummers used that are still used today. Obviously, there are single strokes, which are And then there are double strokes, where the stick is bounced. You hit it, let it bounce, and, and I refer to it as catching it after the second, after the bounce.
takes a few years of practice to get that really good. Uh, all of the drummers play this way because of the tilt of the drum and because of the traditions of the European drummers were always playing this way. It all changed about the 1960s when drummers started playing like this, but you have a hard time playing on a tilted drum with your arm up and you get tired quickly. But they all played in what's called the traditional grip. So the double strokes become, eventually become a roll, what's called a roll, which is multiple fast moving rolls. And I mean, I teach drums and my biggest challenge is to get my students not to have any tension while they're doing that. I mean, I can play that for a long time without having any tension, no tight muscles or anything. So then they started numbering the rolls, five stroke roll. Two, four, five, two, four, five. They were all five strokes. Seven strokes. Two, four, two, four, six, seven, two, four, six, seven. Nine strokes, you just add two more strokes. There's a 10 stroke roll, which is a nine stroke roll plus two singles on the end. Or a nine stroke roll plus one single. So those are, are the rolls that the drummers would learn. They're not hard once you get the rolls down. The other things are the roughs or drags, and the roughs are like three stroke rolls. And I played several of them in, in the examples I played for you. It's like two bounces with this and a single one. Then there are what's called flams, and they sound kind of like the word flam. And then flams are added to other things like flams and taps. And then there's a combination of two single strokes and a double stroke. Two single strokes and a double stroke. So it would be right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left. The doubles are called diddles. It's a diddle. <laughs> so. Those would be para a diddles. Para okay. Then the one, uh, there's one that I played that was part of one of the beats that I used, and it wasn't named this back then because they didn't have even 26 rudiments that came about in the 1930s. This became known as Lesson 25 because they couldn't think of any other name for it. <laughs> And that can be repeated sequentially. So it's got the little drag or the rough on the beginning, and then three individual strokes. So let me talk a little bit about, let me talk about the drum first. This drum is made, it's a modern drum, it was made by Cooperman. Cooperman is a company in Connecticut, Vermont, New Hampshire, several places. Uh, they make them for Williamsburg, uh, Virginia Fife and Drum Corps. They make them for the Old Guard Fife and Drum Corps in Arlington. They make them for the Marine uh, Drum and Bugle Corps. So I called him up and I said, I want a drum like Williamsburg. And he said, I have one uh, that we made up as a, as a demo and it's a smaller drum. I said, okay, how much? And he told me I sent him the money and he, uh, Actually, I put it on a credit card and I shouldn't have done that. But anyway, <laughs> he sent me the drum and it was smaller than this one. So I used it for a year or so and then I said, I want a bigger drum. So he then uh, was able to get me this one. And it's, it's modern. You loosen and tighten the tension or the sound of the, by loosening, loosen the head. Uh, I might as well do it and we'll see what it sounds like when I bring it back. So 
and then by tightening them all up, And they could put fancy artwork on the front of this. They could put a, a large eagle on it. I've seen that. Um, I simply put the stickers of the organizations I belong to as a drummer. Uh, this is Brigade of the American Revolution, which is a reenacting unit. This is Sons of the American Revolution. This is, no, this is something else altogether. This is Brigade. It's got all 13 flags in it. And this is the uh, United States Association of Rudimental Drummers. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a joiner of organizations. <laughs> but the top head looks like it's a skin, but it's plastic. Uh, Remo is a company in California, and they make drum heads. And they make these, they call them fiber skins. They just take the labels off. I mean, I could take the label off with fingernail polish remover. It just takes the paint off. The bottom head is also plastic. Some places are really particular. Some reenacting groups are really particular. They want you to have real animal skin heads. Uh, I just never wanted to fight the rain. I uh, played, played calfskin drum heads in high school. And I remember just playing on them in the rain and the stick would go right through it. And uh, so it's just awful hard to stay tuned. This has the little legs on it, these little, so I can set it down and it's not touching the ground. It also has the rim guards of brass. Uh, so that's, that's my drum. I'm going to talk a little bit about the uniform. And one of the first questions I get is, why do you have a red coat? And this coat is representative of the Virginia. Uh, it would have blue coats with red facings. Fifers and drummers switch colors so they could be found easier. Some people said, well, you mean they could be shot easier? No, that's not necessarily true. Uh, because you could definitely tell, the, excuse me, the British drummers from the American drummers, and nobody was shooting at drummers anyway. If they were shot, they were, it was accidental, kind of. But So if I do a reenactment, for example, uh, if you know where Fort Lawrence is in Ohio, south of Canton, right off from I-77, it's the only Revolutionary War fort in the state of Ohio. And it was manned from, I did my article and will tell you, but it was manned for a very short period of time, maybe nine months, by the Pennsylvania, 8th Pennsylvania, I think 5th Virginia Regiment, and a couple of others. And when they were there, they did not have the reverse colors. They had coats like this. And this is called a regimental coat. This is called a contract coat. This is like walking into the, um, you could walk into Brooks Brothers and have a tailor-made coat. If you walked into, well, Walmart doesn't have these things. <laughs> but, uh, you know, at some other store, you could buy just something off the rack. That's the, the, the comparison. And the price is comparable. I mean, this one cost quite a bit of money. This one did not. But when I'm reenacting with uh, 8th Pennsylvania Brigade at Fort Lawrence, which comes up next weekend, but I'm not going, but it comes up next, I have a whole different uniform that I wear. I have this coat, I have a different pair of, of different other clothes that I wear, and a different hat uniform. Obviously, I've got the drum strap, which holds an extra pair of sticks. The hats are amazing. Uh, you, can, you can be out in the rain and be wet, and you just turn your head and the water will <laughs> you know? uh, This is kind of like a wool felt. They make them out of beaver, they make them out of everything. But underneath the coat are what we call the small clothes. And this includes, let me start with the stockings. That's a good place to start. 
I brought an extra pair of stockings. <laughs> so they're nothing to write home about. These happen to be cotton. Uh, I've got a couple pair, different colors. Uh, I got a couple pair of wool, uh, which are handy when it comes. Similar shirt, same cut as the ruffle shirt that I'm wearing, but it doesn't have the ruffles. And you can see how long the shirt is. Now the only underwear that I knew they wore was, and I don't know how many wore these, these are called Jefferson drawers. <laughs> but anyway, the Jefferson drawers, even with cotton breeches, and that's what they're called, is surprisingly very warm and very comfortable. And these are, this is an extra pair of breeches I have because I'm not taking these off. <laughs> you don't want to see that. But that's, that's what they look like. And it's, it's a chore to go to the bathroom. You've got all these buttons. But in the back, it's got a nice baggy seat. You know? <laughs> and it's got this gusset where you can adjust the, the waistband. So it's, it's kind of a practical. The ground uh, or the shoe tops. And that's because I have a bum knee and I was wearing a knee brace for the whole parade. I mean, a mile and a half, you know, I wouldn't be walking very well today. I still don't, but, but anyway, I had a knee brace on, so I like to wear the longer pants with those. Uh, so then I've got the little garters that are leather that supposedly hold the stockings up, but they, they function that way. Uh, the shoes, take one of them off, take out my super secret insole. <laughs> well, the shoes are cut on a straight last. When I got them, there's no left or right. There's no arch support. There's no insole. So I wore these at a reenactment and I, I almost ruined my toes. Uh, I had a pair of commercial insoles put in them. And the best thing I would advise people right now is if you don't want to go out and spend $50 on insoles, take your best pair of tennis shoes and take the insoles out and put them in these. Buy shoes an extra size larger so that that insole, but anyway, they got the bubble toe on it or the ball toe. Uh, if I was buying another pair of shoes, I'd buy a half size larger. But I'd do a lot of things different if I <laughs> buy new stuff. Uh, my wife's cut me off from buying new stuff. <laughs> As you can see, I have too much stuff up here. Uh, so I've done the drum and the uniform. Uh, I've explained why the coats are different. Some of the reference material I have is up here. Uh, but I want to come on and, and play some more for you. Uh, and try to demonstrate, I'll try to do this without the drum, because I'll probably be able to do it better and I won't be fighting the drum. But the facing movements that they used, now their attention for the soldiers was not the usual one we see today. The left heel was kind of on the instep of the right foot, and the left knee was slightly bent. But to do a right face, they lifted their toes, turned, and then brought the right foot back. To do a left face, they did the same thing, if I can do this and not fall down, turn, and then they bring the right foot up. So there were always signals for those. To do an about, they did basically the same thing. Well, no, they put the, the right foot back and then swivel. But they did all of them swiveling. Not like what we learned back in the Middle Ages when we were in the service. Uh, they had, you know, the whole, this whole thing was, was not even used then. And so to do a right face or left face, there would be a verbal command and I, 
never really been around in places where they use these a lot. Uh, because the people in charge were just about ready to say, okay, just turn to the right. You know? <laughs> uh, but if somebody was doing, wanting to do a right face, and these are all logical, but a right face would be a single stroke and a flam after the command right face. So I don't know whether they did that at that point in two, but I don't know how they would do that with the left face because there's two strokes. An about face would be three strokes. So that's, you know, how they would use the drums to make those commands. A lot of times, on the, and I should have explained this, on the battlefield during a, uh, a battle, you've got cannon firing, you've got muskets firing after the initial first two volleys, then it's pretty much fire as fast as they can load. So there's a lot of noise, but the fifes and drums can be heard above all that. It's just really, it's a fascinating phenomenon. <clears throat> but I was going to have, if I had more kids here, mm -hmm. I would have more kids do the wheel movements. But the wheel movement of a, of a group is interesting because they stand in a line, and if they want to wheel this way, which would be a left wheel, all of the people on that end would be looking this way, and the person on the this end would be looking this way. So they would just wheel around, and this person wouldn't move hardly at all. They would probably stay pretty stationary. If they went the other way, then that person on that end would be stationary. He would be looking this way, and everybody else would be looking this way. The way it's done right is you're touching shoulders the whole time so that you don't have a tendency to swing out and lose the, the connectivity, which is a typical human type of thing to want to do if you're going around a circle is the people on the outside want to swing out. I teach band, I've seen this. <laughs> can't get them to do it the other way. Because they're not standing that close. But Okay, I want to go over some of the other stuff I have up here on the table. Uh, and then I'll play some more, quite a bit for you. Uh, are pretty easy. Uh, they have a faint flam and a hard flam. Again, it's probably soft and loud. And they just take two notes and connect them left to right. Because on this, the left hand is on the top and the right hand is on the bottom. So that makes it pretty easy. But if you look at, here is where they want left, left, right, right. You know, they, you know it's kind of an ingenious thing to do. Uh, this is the drummer's call. So if you can, if you know which hand you're gonna be on top, the left hand's on top, so it's left, left, right, right, left, left, right, right, left. And then you, play a flam. So anyway, I have some other books up here that are a fife and drum sort of thing. Uh, the soldier might carry um, his own knife, dinner knife, and a fork. And these are <laughs> bone handled steel, and then I happen to carry a spoon that's made from an antler, it's carved from an antler of some type. Uh, I'm not real sure that, in fact, I know that most regular soldiers would not have carried a spoon. They had no use for a spoon. I'll explain that in a minute. Well, I'll explain it right now. If you had a bowl or a cup, why would you need a spoon? You know, you can, you can use the same, either one. They might have had either a bowl and a cup and a plate,
but they probably not would have they probably not would have not had all three but maybe you know some of them might have they might have taken a bowl from somebody but you could have had a cup and a, and a bowl and been able to get dinner or you could have a plate and a cup or a plate and a bowl you know either way they did smoke and they smoked pipes this is my it's never been used this is my clay pipe it broke uh, i had a clay pipe that i used quite a bit but just as a demonstration but uh, uh, it when they fall and they hit the ground they're done for they just shatter and they find they find scraps of pipes clay pipes in various places in virginia just stacks of them almost like seashells but you would light your tobacco with flint and steel by taking a, a piece of steel and they this was pretty common and then flint and I, I've got a piece of char cloth on this which is linen that I've charred not a good piece of flint. Besides, I would give up smoking by the time I got it lit. But supposedly, you're able to do that and the spark itself goes back onto the paint, onto the char cloth, and it lights enough and you drop the char cloth onto the tobacco in the, in the pipe. The other way that you might do it is find some sunshine and a magnifying glass. Remember? The old thing of killing ants, you know, and you can light your pipe that way. If you're really careful with it. So I was in Boonesboro. Oh, I've got a little cute little pipe tamper here. It just helps to pipe tamp the tobacco down in the pipe. And it's it's a hand holding a pipe. It's a cute little thing. Well, I was down in Boonesboro, Kentucky, just visiting, looking at this primitive, wasn't re necessarily a revolutionary war, but this it was an Indian or Native American camp, an early American camp, and this guy was sitting there. He was smoking his clay pipe, or maybe it was a, you know, it might have been a long one like this, which is a lot better than well, if you're going to smoke, mm -hmm. than the clay pipe. Clay pipes are hot. They are hot, and the tobacco they get hot to touch, but the the, the smoke coming out of them is really hot. It just it burns. It makes it makes you want to quit. I've never smoked this one with the reed, but he was smoking a pipe, and I said, so you lit that with flint and steel? Being kind of sarcastic, or do you have matches? And he said, no, I have flint and steel. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of clever. So you can make char cloth by taking a little piece of linen and putting it inside a tin, poking a hole in the tin, put the char cloth in there and I did this on my charcoal grill mm -hmm. I just put this down on the charcoal and the smoke will start coming out but it won't burn it won't catch so it just chars the cloth inside and makes the char cloth and I have quite a bit of it uh, I use it you know I, I don't go out and camp out and try to light you know I'd starve to death and then I can quit smoking but here's the uh, I'll pass this around this is my spice box. And I have some soap if somebody wants to, you know, wants to clean up after this, you know, you can take this pretty nasty soap <laughs> to clean up. Uh, but one of the things that George Washington was pretty particular about, and people misunderstand it, he didn't have a problem so much with the hair, the length of the hair. A lot of the men had hair, oh, as, as long as some of you women, um, and they would do it, you know, they would put a ponytail. Uh, of course, they did have the powdered wigs. One of the reasons why they had the powdered wigs was they didn't want to cut their, they could get their hair cut short, and, but they didn't want it to look like it was short hair. But the powdered wigs also helped prevent the spread of lice. But Washington 
was very particular about having his soldiers clean shaven. So he, yeah, and he, he, there was no facial hair, no mustaches, no beards. Sideburns were supposed to be shorter. Uh, so here is some shaving soap, a shaving brush, and the lethal weapon. The straight razor. And I've never shaved with this. This is just nice and shiny. It's never been used. I just don't have the guts to shave. With my shave. I should probably practice sometimes. But. So one other one other item here, and then I'll play some more for you. Oh, I have this little pouch of tobacco. Uh, I get my tobacco at tinderbox when I get it, and and I, you know, I'll smoke a pipe on a reenactment, and somebody will always come up and say, "Where'd you get that? What is it? What is it?" Do they they smell the aromatic, uh, and I prefer pipe tobacco. Most reenactments, they prefer well. They won't let you smoke something like a cigarette because it's sim strictly a 20th century sort of thing. It's out of place. But pipes are considered okay. There were some cigars because they tobacco was in a twist. Uh, they would dry it in the, wherever they dry tobacco, and then they would twist it, and, uh, and it became useful in whatever forms they were. And the tobacco back then. Yeah, it had nicotine in it, but it was did not have all the chemicals and everything that tobacco does today. But even pipe tobacco, I suppose, does not have any very many chemicals. But enough about that. This is a sewing kit. It has a little awl for punching holes in things. have some uh, sinew, uh, which is handy for a lot of things. I mean, it's, it's not a thread. It's thicker than a thread. I'm kind of glad I found it. I've got a use for it. I do have thread. Uh, well, I've got several different buttons. case. Oh, there's obviously you need a thimble. Mm -hmm. Wooden thimble. And a pair of scissors. <laughs> and this has become very handy to carry because uh, I've been on, on trips or reenactments and somebody said, does anybody have a sewing kit? Nobody else had one and I have one. And, so I can charge whatever I want for that. <laughs> uh, so they would all carry this stuff in a haversack. Oh, I've got it on. <laughs> must be. A haversack is kind of like a, a man purse. You know, you just put whatever you need in there, except live animals. <laughs> and then, of course, you have a canteen my canteen. Uh, it's wood lined with pine pitch. It's still smell a little bit of it. I used it and used it and I realized this thing must be building up some nasty bacteria. <laughs> so a place I know has uh, stuff to get rid of bacteria in water bottles. You know, like the jugs, the five gallon jugs and your cooler thing. So I got some and put it in there and then I dumped it out yesterday after the parade, and there was something black fell out of it. <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't catch it quick enough. I couldn't tell whether it was maybe some of the something inside it, or whether it was some sort of a bug or something. I don't know. But anyway, uh, I'm going to play some more for you. Some of the beatings, and a lot of these will sound very similar to the one just before it or just after it because they didn't have a whole lot of variety. And they each one kind of have a title. Um, this one is called Trim the Velvet.
and it repeats. Same thing, like I said on the other things, they just repeat and repeat. This is a quick step or long march. It'll sound very similar in a lot of ways. Open beating sounds pretty much like the others. It's called open beating number two. I don't know what open beating number one was, but open beating number three is open beating four. variations within them, um, you know, I make up what I play, like in the parade, you know, I just make it up. Some of it is like this, some of it's a combination of trim the value and an open beating number three or, you know, whatever, which would be for a burial service. same thing over and over, same several measures. In, a, in an actual burial service or funeral service, it would be even slower than that. Uh, it would be really, really very slow. Uh, I played most of these faster than what, not that fast. Comfortable walking tempo. So, now I'm going to finish up, we're just a little over an hour, this thing sounding right, uh, with, a, with a standard this is a drum solo that uh, most kids should learn at some point, and it's called The Downfall of Paris, and of course none of that happened until the 1800s, but uh, uh, I'm going to play it for you, I'll just take all, no repeats, just play it straight through so you can hear it. Uh, hear it straight through. Mm -hmm. 